But first, let me begin by clarifying the purpose of nonviolent communication. Its purpose is to help you to do what you already know how to do. Now, why do we need to learn something today that you already know how to do? Because sometimes we forget to do this. We forget because we've been educated to forget. Now, what is it that I'm talking about that we already know how to do? The purpose of this process is to help us to connect in a way that makes natural giving possible. Natural giving possible. What do I mean by natural giving? Uh, let me do you a song to make it clear uh, what I mean by natural giving. I never feel more given to than when you take from me When you understand the joy I feel caring for you And you know my giving isn't done to put you in my debt But because I want to live the love I feel for you To receive with grace May be the greatest giving There's no way that I can separate the two When you give to me I give you my receiving And when you take from me I feel so given to You all know that giving. You know how to do it. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm remembering to stay with that quality of giving, moment by moment, in any connection. But we also all know that it's easy to lose it. It's easy to lose that connection, so that instead of enjoying that quality of giving, which is possible every moment in every contact we have, in spite of how precious that is, we forget. And instead of playing the game that that song is about, which I call making life wonderful, that's, that's the most fun game I've ever heard, instead, much of the time, we play another game called Who's Right? Have you ever played that game? <laughs> it's a game where everybody loses, so isn't this amazing that we all know about this quality of giving that the song was about. It's possible every moment. We, we, we find that the richest thing to do, and much of our life we end up playing Who's Right? Now, the game of who's right involves two of the most devious things human beings have ever come upon. One, punishment. See, because if you're wrong in the game of who's right, then you deserve to suffer. Can you imagine a more diabolical concept to educate people? So, uh, if you haven't already abstained from punishment, I'm sure by the end of the day that will no longer be a part of your consciousness. No more punishment. You won't do it in your families. We'll get rid of it with criminals. It just makes things more violent. We'll find other ways to deal with other nations beside punishment. No more punishment. No more reward. It's the same game. It's part of the game of who's right. If you're right, then you get rewarded. If you're wrong, you get punished. No more. No more. It's created enough violence on the planet. No more guilt induction, see? No more shame. No more concepts of duty and obligation. Just what the song is about, natural giving. So how did we get off target? We got off target, according to Walter Wink, 
theologian who writes in his book, The Powers That Be, we got off target about 5,000 years ago. We, we lost, we got off target because we started to get some wild thinking. Wild thinking that human beings are innately evil. And when you believe that, that human beings are innately evil, then if things aren't going as we would like, what's the corrective process? The corrective process is penitence, you see. When people are evil, you think that the way to bring about change when people are behaving in a way you don't like is to make people hate themselves for what they're doing. So for these political reasons and theological reasons, we started to develop a language that I call jackal language. It's a language that cuts us off from life. And, uh, makes it very easy to, do, to be violent, very easy to be violent. In fact, in that book I mentioned, Wink says that domination cultures, one of the things you have to educate people is to make violence enjoyable. See? And we've done a good job of that. We make violence enjoyable in our culture. For the two hours a night from seven to nine when children are watching television the most, in 75% of the programs they watch, the hero either kills somebody or beats them up, you see? So we, and when does this happen at the climax of the program? We, we've been educated for quite a while to make violence enjoyable. So even though I think what that song was about is what is really closer to our nature, this natural giving, we've been educated to make violence enjoyable and educated in a way we can even be violent to our children. So what is jackal language like? See, jackal language, as I've mentioned, is a language of moralistic judgments. You think in terms of who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad. And when you mention change, yes, we want change at times, so how do you get change in the jackal system? Watch a parent try to bring about change in the child. This is a parent teaching a young child, say one of the most important words in jackal. Say you're sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not really sorry. I can see it. You're not really sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I forgive you. <laughs> can you imagine a game like that? Can you imagine a parent responding to a child that way? And if a parent is going to do that to a child in their own family, what are they going to do to people from other cultures who behave in a way they don't appreciate? So of course you're going to have violence wherever you have this kind of thinking. In cultures that do not have this thinking, you don't see violence, you see. So that's how we got off target. Even though we could be playing the game make life wonderful each moment, we have been educated for quite a while to play another game, who's right. So what are the parts of this game of who's right? I've, all, I've just mentioned one of them. One part is moralistic judgments, learning how to go up to our head and think basically in terms of right and wrong, good and bad, normal, abnormal. I learned this game very well. I speak several dialects of jackal. I grew, up speak, I grew up in Detroit. We spoke a rather harsh dialect of jackal. We might call it Detroit jackal. <laughs> For example, uh, if I'm out driving and uh, someone is driving in a way that I don't like, and again, I want to install change, you see, I, I roll down the window, idiot! <laughs> now, theoretically, the person is supposed to repent. Uh, I confess I was wrong, sir. Uh, I, will, I will change the error of my ways. <laughs> it's a great theory. Uh, it didn't work. I've tried it more than once. It doesn't work. So I thought maybe it was that particular dialect of jackal. So I decided to get the more cultured use of jackal. So I went to the university and got a doctor's degree in professional jackal. Now when somebody's driving in a way I don't like, I roll down the window. Psychopath! <laughs> uh, 
still doesn't work. <laughs> you see. There's another part of this language of jackal. Amtsprache. Amtsprache. That's very important. You see, a language that uh, denies choice. Denies responsibility for our actions. I use the word Amtsprache for this part, uh, having read an interview with the Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann at his trial for war crimes in Jerusalem. Eichmann was asked, was it hard to send tens of thousands of people to their death? And Eichmann answered candidly, he said, to tell you the truth, it was easy. Our language made it easy. That interview shocked, that, uh, that answer shocked his interviewer. And his interviewer said, what language? Eichmann said, in fact, my fellow Nazi officers and I, we had our own name for our language. We called it Amtsprache. Amt in German means office and Sprache, language. I'd call that bureaucratic language. He was asked for some examples. Eichmann said, it's a language in which you deny responsibility for your, your actions. So if somebody asks you why you did it, you say, I had to. Then you don't feel so bad if you have to do it, you see, you're not responsible. But why did you have to, Jack? Superior's orders. Company policy. They made me do it. I couldn't do elsewise. Very dangerous language, Amtsprache. Very dangerous. We have giraffe schools. Uh, with, I use the word giraffe, you see, as a symbol for nonviolence. We'll see today that uh, the language we're going to study is a language of the heart. And so I use giraffe language for that because giraffes have the largest heart of any land animal. So. Um, giraffe requires... Uh, Always being conscious of choice, you see. We never do anything that we don't choose to do. But I was uh, teaching giraffe to a group of parents and teachers in one uh, community, and uh, we have giraffe schools throughout uh, the world. We have five in Israel, four in Palestine, uh, some in Serbia, and so forth. And in giraffe schools, of course, we want to make sure that certainly that the teachers and parents never use Amtsprache. One of the most dangerous languages in the world. To teach a child you have to do something. So I was saying this one time in St. Louis, Missouri to a group of parents and teachers and a mother got very upset. She said, but there are some things you have to do whether you like to do it or not. It's our job as parents to teach our children what they have to do. I mean, there's things I do every day that I hate to do, but there just are some things you have to do. I said, could you give me an example? She said, well, easy, there's so many, let me think. Okay, like when I leave here tonight, I have to go home and cook. I hate to cook. <laughs> I hate it with a passion, but I've done it every day for 20 years. <laughs> Even when I've been sick. <laughs> well, I said, I'll be very happy today to show you another way of thinking another language that I hope would open up happier possibilities for you. Well, I'm pleased to report she was a rapid giraffe student. She went home that very evening and announced to her family that she no longer wanted to cook. I got some feedback from her family. <laughs> the feedback came two weeks later when I swung through that city again and was doing an evening workshop, and the, who shows up? Uh, the, her two older sons, she had four sons. And they, they came up at the beginning to introduce themselves, and I said, hey, I'm glad you guys came up here. I've been very curious what's going on in your family. Your, your mother's been calling me regularly, telling me about all the changes she made in her life since the training. And I, he, like, what happened that first night when she came home and announced that she no longer wanted to cook? The oldest son said to me, Marshall, I said to myself, thank God. <laughs> I said, help me understand that one. 
He said, I said to myself, now maybe she won't complain at every meal, you see. You see, natural giving, what I started the day off with that song, anything we do in life that isn't coming out of that energy, we pay for it and everybody else pays for it. Anything we do out of fear of punishment, if we don't, everybody pays for it. Anything we do for a reward, everybody pays for it. Everything we do to make people like us, everybody pays for it. Everything we do out of guilt, shame, duty, obligation, everybody pays for it. That isn't what we were designed for. We were designed to enjoy giving, to give from the heart, 